Thank you so much for joining me for um, Manitoba um, Craft Council's Spring Talk. My name is Amina Haswell. I am the owner and lead broom squire um, from Prairie Breeze Folk Art Studio. Uh, today, I'm really excited to talk about my passion of broom making and the fibers that we use um, to make brooms here in North America and across the globe. Um, you'll notice throughout uh, our chat today that um, there is one consistent element to all the brooms and fibers around the world is that um, they're both different and both the same. Um, so you'll see some consistent styles, um, consistent fibers used across the globe. And so um, it really is sort of the, the, the fibers that bind us um, everywhere around the world. So before we get started, I'd like to uh, say some words of welcome from the Manitoba Craft Council, uh, thanking you for attending the Craft Council Springs um, talk series. Uh, it is co-sponsored by MAWA, the Mentoring Artists for Women's Art. The Craft Council is located on traditional lands, uh, um, Treaty 1 of the Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dene, and Dakota, and is the birthplace of the Métis Nation. So uh, we're going to cover quite a bit of stuff about this wonderful household tool that nobody probably thinks about, um, but is one of the most common, most used, and um, one of the more interesting household tools that we have um, in the world. You know, I don't think many of us stop to really ponder about our blenders, but uh, there's been a lot written and a lot of tradition connected to the household broom. We'll also take a look at some fun um, broom facts, uh, take a little dive into the history of uh, brooms and broom making. We'll talk about the different fibers, both um, natural plant fibers and animal fibers that are used for making brooms. We'll also take a quick look at the various countries around the globe and some of the types of brooms and fibers that they use. And then we'll touch on just really quickly some of the fibers that can be used here locally in Manitoba to make brooms. So the common household broom, it's both fascinating and functional, and we'll talk a little bit about that. We'll talk about the fundamentals of a broom, what is a broom, you know, what really describes a broom, um, and what constitutes a broom, in other words. Uh, the fact that brooms are used not only for, you know, routine cleansing and cleaning of the home, but also for ceremony and ritual. We'll talk a little bit about, <clears throat> excuse me, the composition of a broom. Um, and uh, and kind of highlight, you know, what makes up a broom, uh, in particular the brooms that we make here at Prairie Breeze Folk Art Studio. So fascination and function of brooms. You know, this humble broom is one of the oldest human inventions. You know, before we could probably say words, and you know, we're um, scribing things in caves, we were probably making some form of apparatus to be able to dust and remove debris from whatever type of dwelling. Um, you know, regardless of whether you live in a five-story mansion or you live in a flavella, um, human beings combine some sort of material, whether, you know, natural fibers or plastic or wood or something to be able to remove debris from their um, spaces where they live. Um, and so you find brooms for multiple purposes around the world that are used for cleaning outside in the yard, for cleaning in the kitchen, for cleaning out the cattle pen and everything in between. You know. Over the last couple of decades, um, there's been a broom revival. Uh, folks have become fascinated once again with the broom and all the many facets and styles that it comes in. You know, from major fashion magazines to designers around the world, the broom has become a muse. Here depicted in these pictures, we've got um, some brooms from um, a, a collection shoot for Barena Venzenia, a Italian um, fashion house. And the brooms are really the perfect accent to the clothing that they were showcasing for that collection. And those particular brooms are made in this small town in Italy by this one gentleman. Um, I've done quite a bit of research because I've been trying to replicate the brooms. And, um, you know, it's one of a kind. This particular style is only made there. So it's very unique. 
And then you have places such as Vogue magazine that have, you know, done articles on the most beautiful brooms for your inner witch uh, that really just house just exquisite brooms from around the world, you know, coming from broom houses, uh, broom fashion houses, I say, um, that are just creating really innovative, cool, uh, looking at the broom in very different ways, not just in a functional way, but also decorative. And uh, I know I read an article um, a little while back that talked about brooms becoming the new ceramic and that there was a bit of a broom scene brewing where, you know, folks, you know, th there was a, a big editor for New York magazine who actually left her job and um, became a broom maker. And uh, stories of other people, folks who work for Martha Stewart leaving, you know, their lucrative role at Martha Stewart Living to take on and create um, brooms of all types. <coughs> so the broom is, you know, really had its moment to shine. And I think will continue to have its moment to shine, especially as we all gravitate towards natural fibers and eco-friendly solutions. So the fundamentals of a broom, you know, anything, any tool that's used to sweep a surface, uh, floors, counters, furnishings, whatever it may be, you know, traditionally it was made out of um, wood, straw, and twine, and typically you use to move messes, dirt, and dust into a corner so that it can be easily disposed. So it's often accompanied with a dustpan. Um, uh, and it comes in every size, shape, and color. At Prairie Breeze, we really focus on color. That's something that I've always been passionate about is really showcasing many different types of brooms in a lot of different color varieties. <clears throat> And actually, there's a number of places in the world, such as you'll see with the um, Southeast Asian brooms and the African brooms are very colorful and, um, and lively, way more colorful than the ones we do. They, they incorporate quite a bit of color, um, which is quite nice. Uh, so, well, you know, the other thing is brooms are typically anything that's fashioned out of plastic, which is your modern day mass produced broom to straw, animal hairs and plant fibers. So we'll mostly be covering animal hairs and plant fibers in our discussion. That's what we um, tend to use here at Prairie Breeze Folk Arts. And um, a lot of our colleagues, our broom making buddies um, across North America tend to use that a lot as well. So household cleansing and ceremony. So the broom is used for a lot of different things. It's said to be calming and therapeutic just in the action of sweeping. It sort of allows you to sort of drift into space and think about other things um, and collect your thoughts. It's much, you know, I kind of um, align it to dishwashing. I love dishwashing because I don't have to think about anything. I'm just kind of going through the motions and, and processing things in my head. Just a couple of words used to describe brooms. It's beautiful, functional, traditional, handcrafted, artisan, and sophisticated. And to think that something so utilitarian, um, yet so uh, unique, um, could be looked at in so many different ways. You know, for those who um, focus on the magical um, or the witchy, regardless of whatever term you choose to, to use, or those who also focus on the spiritual aspect of the broom. Uh, the broom has a lot more meaning. It um, is used to clean spaces um, and move um, positive energies. It's also used to ward off evil spirits. Um, so the broom you know, has a lot of functions um, and um, means something different to, to um, various people around the world. composition of a broom. So uh, depending on the type of broom, and there's so many different types of brooms, uh, the composition is a little bit different. The one that we typically um, focus on, which is our traditional sweepers, um, are um, made up of three key components. So the sweep, that's the part that's touching the surface and moving the debris. The handle or broom bar, that's the part that is um, you know, maneuvering around that sweep. And then the binding cap is what we have coined it. Uh, and that's really where the natural fiber um, is being adhered to the handle. And of course, when we talk about handheld brooms or brushes, we often talk about um, the sweep and the handle. 
And often the sweep in the handle when we are dealing with a handheld whisk is often fabricated out of the same material. It's really the opposite end of the soft end of the material. Um, oftentimes the stock or just a harder, coarser end. And that's typically the part that's more tightly bound and utilized as a handle. So these are just some images um, from our um, photo collection of those three key areas. Um, and you can see it really uh, quite clearly here, some of the intricate work and detailing that you can go into uh, with our uh, binding caps in terms of how we wrap and uh, fasten that natural uh, fiber to the handle. So now let's take an opportunity to delve a little bit into the history of rooms. Um, it's not uh, um, widely touted or known um, about some of the historical facts of how brooms came to be or even how broom corn that we primarily use in our business um, sort of made its way to, to North America. So we'll talk a little bit about that. And I would be um, uh, ostracized, I'm sure, if I did not take an opportunity to talk about the connection between brooms and witches. So we'll delve a little bit into that. So the basic history of the North American broom, um, it's believed that Benjamin Franklin is actually the one responsible for bringing the broom from Africa, um, or I should say broom corn from Africa. <laughs> it's understood that he was the first to enclose and send that grain um, to North America. And as a result, um, broom corn was grown and um, continues to be grown to this day. Uh, at one point in time, uh, broom corn was touted as the next sugar uh, cane. Uh, it was thought that it would be able to be widely used um, to produce sugar. It does produce a very sweet molasses. Um, and uh, unfortunately, because of the processes that would be needed to really harvest any sweet um, uh, or sugar from it, it just was not ideal. So um, it primarily shifted its focus to being used for the uh, manufacturing of brooms. So we have Levi Dickinson, a farmer from Massachusetts, uh, to thank for this flat um, broom that we use today. So depicted here are some shaker style brooms um, that are bound flat. And after Levi really um, developed that concept, it was the shaker women, uh, particularly in New York, that really took it to heart and began producing and growing broom manufacturing in North America. And at one point in time, there were over 1,000 broom making factories in the United States alone. Um, probably in the early 1900s, probably around 1920, 1930s, those numbers dropped significantly. And so now there's probably 100 or so broom manufacturers across um, the US, um, but there is growing numbers of home-based small um, uh, broom makers like myself um, that are turning to the craft and um, uh, building um, a small industries in broom making. So one of the things we'll talk about now is the witchiness of brooms. And so um, witchy wonders of brooms, uh, it's believed that it was in the 1400s that Guillaume Edlin, a Augustine priest, it was the first person to be connected to um, as a witch uh, and make the connection between a witch and a broom. He was charged with witchcraft and had acknowledged that he had flown um, with a Bethlehem broom. Um, there's a lot that's written and a lot of metaphor and poetry and literature that connects the broom to witchcraft. <clears throat> and that continues today, you know, when we think about Halloween, one of the first symbols that comes to mind is um, the broom. And in particular, it's the Bassam broom as seen in the picture here by um, my broom making apprentice, um, May, uh, is the natural harvested Bassam broom. So it's the rounded broom that is really um, touted as being the witch's broom. So let's take a little look at all the different fibers. Um, I know, you know, Manitoba, has a lot of fiber producers um, 
And there are so many different fibers that are used for making uh, brooms and brushes across the globe. And we'll just delve into some of them. There's so many that we could do a whole chat just on all those fibers from around the world. But uh, I narrowed in on some of the ones that we used and some of the ones that are most commonly used in some of the regions that we're going to highlight. So Tampico is a fiber that is um, uh, derived from the leaf ribs of the agave or ixle, as they would say in Spanish. And it um, is a wonderful fiber, silky, soft. We use it for our oasis dry brush and for things that are coming in contact with the body or skin uh, because it really is very um, soothing and um, silky to the touch. Uh, it's also very complicated to harvest, um, basically to produce those thin, beautiful fibers. It's pounded and scraped the leaf in order to separate all of the fibers in the leaf. So it's <coughs> quite labor intensive. Um, and most of it comes from Mexico. We have broom corn or sorghum vulgare, uh, or multicolor broom corn or sorghum, um, which is what we use um, primarily at Prairie Breeze Folk Arts. And while it originated in Africa, it is not super popular in Africa now. Uh, there's a lot of other fibers that are used there, um, but it is very commonly grown in um, North America, um, mostly actually as a decorative item for, you know, vases and, and um uh, decor, uh, but uh, it um, is also used for brew making. We've got the palmyrae fiber. Um, you'll notice that there's a trend in the next couple of ones. It's all from various types of palms around the world. <coughs> and the palm seems to be just that right type of material that has the elasticity and the durability <coughs> sorry, to produce the fibers that are ideal for making brooms. Um, you've got the sisale, um, or sisal, which is uh, from the sisal palm in Mexico. Uh, that's also used to make ropes. It's extremely durable and extremely strong. Um, so it works really well for broom making and for uh, long life of a uh, broom. You've got cocoa fibers as well. And then you have some what's referred to as rice straw or rice root. It's not actually from rice. Um, somehow it became connected with that. Uh, it's actually from um, various dried stalks from cereal plants, sort of a mixture um, that are then fashioned into brooms. Um, not the most durable <coughs> material. Um, but it is a little bit softer and silkier than uh, the broom corn is. And then you have the rice root, which also hails from Mexico and from a particular plant or grass called the zatacon. And then plant-based fibers, some more. Um, so African broom store or straw is one of the uh, materials we use. Um, I actually have... Uh, an item here, um, which is our ferro whisk, which is made from that. It's much stiffer than your um, standard um, broom corn. And so it's great for outdoors, for moving dirt and debris, um, mud rooms, and other outside areas of the home uh, where you're dealing with um, larger and harder debris. And then you have what's referred to as broom grass or tiger grass. It's also called about 10 million other names, depending on the country um, you're hailing from. Um, but it hails from the Thysanolina um, plant. And uh, I can barely say that. Um, and it's actually common to a lot, large portion of Asia. So it's very um, typical. Uh, typically used in the brooms that are hailing from uh, Asia and parts of Africa. Also parts of Hawaii and California, it uh, is grown uh, pretty effectively. Animal-based fibers. So pretty much any animal with any reasonable length of hair you could use to fashion a broom or brush. Um, the ones most typically used though are horse hair. Uh, that makes for great um, brushes. A lot of, um, of the fabulous brushes made with horse hair come out of uh, Germany or Europe. And then there's also badger, <coughs> Chinese long-haired goat, 
ostrich feathers, which are used for more dusting brushes and other um, lighter brushing and dusting um, tools. And then you've got squirrel and mink. Um, I've never thought about uh, going out and getting any squirrel to make any brushes, but apparently um, squirrel farms exist and are used um, for making, in particular, um, makeup brushes uh, used quite often squirrel and mink um, just for the softness of the um, fur or hair. Um, so now we'll delve a little bit into the different countries that we wanted to highlight today and some of the styles of brooms that um, we see coming out of those countries as well as some of the fibers that they're typically using. So here's our wonderful map of the world. And uh, what we did was we just took a little broom and kind of uh, landed in a couple of the key spots that we're gonna chat about today. So Japan, so we draw quite a bit of inspiration from Japan here at Prairie Breeze. Uh, we make um, two uh, style brooms that are stemming from the Edo era um, in Japan. And um, the styles, uh, the Edo style really bundles things and then combines and aggregates um, that material together. So as you can see here in the image, you've got the um, Shuro Hoki, which is the one on top, and then your standard Shuro broom below. And it's made from hemp palm tree and often in a bamboo um, stick with wrapped with straw, a combination of straw, um, or sorry, straw, string, copper, wire, tacks, and nails. So it's quite beautiful. I find in making brooms, whenever you combine copper with anything, it looks quite lovely. There's that richness of the, the copper tone that really makes something look um, much more sophisticated and stylish. And so this style of brooms is very popular in your high-end home um, goods stores. Uh, what they do to sort of get these lengthened fibers, which would be similar to a broom that you would see made out of other fibers, is they actually score it to cut the, um, the bark of the, the hemp palm to get long strands to make it have a, a similar sweeping action. It's said that these types of brooms are extremely long lasting. Um, so they're great and they have a long tradition of producing both the Edo, obviously that goes way far back and the Shiro broom in Japan. <clears throat> so North American. So we're fortunate here in North America that um, there are a number of institutions in the U.S. that have really been um, uh, shepherding and um, keeping strong the tradition of broom making. One such institution is Berea College. It actually trains people, <coughs> students on how to make brooms and uses it for social enterprise. Um, they specialize in two styles and you can see them in the photo here. We've got our Appalachian style, which is a style that we typically make our large sweepers in here at Prairie Breeze. And then they also do it in the shaker style, which is the one, um, second one to the right in the picture, um, which is you know much more um, wrapped than uh, plated. <clears throat> and then of course there's brooms of the Philippines. So I get asked um, probably every couple of months by someone, you know, do you make a broom either the Wallace Tambo or the Wallace Ting Ting um, uh, from the Philippines? And unfortunately. Um, the transport, import, and export of materials for broom making is actually quite tight. Um, so we have a huge process we go through to bring in broom corn just from the U.S. or Mexico. Um, and uh, much the same for if we bring in any African broom store, or straw, or Tampico. Um, so it is very closely monitored as an agricultural product. And so we haven't been able to land our hands on any of the um, tiger grass that's used for um, those two types of brooms. But as soon as we do, we know we'll be fastening some um, Wallace Tambos and, and Ting Tings and um, sharing it with the folks that have an interest in um, uh, connecting with those traditional brooms from back home. 
Southeast Asia. So Southeast Asia has some of the most beautiful brooms. They're so intricately um, woven and plated, um, often a combination between the natural fiber sweeps and plastic, as well as bamboo and other hardwoods. Um, so th for the most part, they're eco-friendly. There's often a little bit more plastic involved in it. Um, so for us, it's, it isn't a, an ideal match because uh, we're really focused on um, zero <clears throat> waste to landfill and as eco-friendly eco as possible. And um, so, for example, this beautiful curved broom you see here, while it's probably several hours <coughs> <clears throat> of weaving, or at least it would be for me, for someone or a family who produces these every day, they probably have it down to a very quick science. Um, you know, they're only making $10 maybe Canadian uh, for one of those perms. So really the amount of effort and energy going into producing them doesn't get returned in the retail value of them. And so one of the things that I've read quite a bit about is sort of the tradition um, in um, countries such as India and other places is sort of dying off because it just isn't as profitable. Uh, no one's going to tell their daughter or son to go into broom making to make $10 a broom when they can go into something a little bit more profitable um, over the long term. So um finding experts and um, folks that really know how to make these is getting harder and harder to do. <clears throat> One of the things you'll notice here about the East Asian or the Southeast Asian brooms, it's, it's very similar to some of the other ones you're going to see. And so one of the things I said at the beginning is you'll find that um, things are very different, but also very much the same. Uh, that there is this uh, consistent pattern or style of brooms of you know, sort of the elongated, straight, uh, harder material um, broom, simply bound for outdoors and a much more ornate and um, spanned out, fanned out uh, sort of broom for the indoors. So the Netherlands um, has a, a very popular broom that you might see in places like Lee Valley or um, some of your uh, hardware stores. And it's the Dutch broom. It's crafted using rice straw, um, which as I mentioned earlier, isn't actually derived from rice, um, but it is used quite effectively to make um, these simple hand whisks that are used um, by carpenters and uh, craft people to, <clears throat> to uh, clean up their spaces. They're quite effective for cleaning up debris. We fashion one out of broom corn um, that uh, we um, promote as being a really effective tool for folks with uh, workshops and that do carpentry. <coughs> and it's very simply bound. Um, these particular ones are bound with a um, plastic, uh, a sort of a vinyl um, thread, um, if you will that gets uh, simply wounded up the, um, the side of the uh, whisk. And then there's Mexico. So Mexico has so many of the various natural fibers that you can use for broom making, which is fabulous. Um, and they're not actually you know, widely known for making a lot of the large sweepers. Um, so Mexico has much more notoriety for making brooms and brushes, sorry, brushes um, and scrubbers than uh, long sweeper kitchen household style brooms. Um, so whether it's, you know, uh, Tempico being used for industrial or household brushes for polishing metal, iron, steel, or aluminum, they're also used for, you know, shoe polishing brushes and um, uh, sponges and other utensils for inside the home in the kitchen and whatnot. Um, Tempico, uh, that fiber that I earlier talked about, these are some images here <clears throat> of the agave plant and the Tempico being fashioned and um, beaten and um, smoothed out in order to release the fibers. So in the Caribbean, um, one of the brooms that we sort of sell a similar version to is called the coquet broom. And it's made from the shaft of the coconut leaf. And it's bundled and bound together with very simple twine. <coughs> it isn't typically a broom that lasts super long. 
it's a broom that um, uh, functions quite well, but definitely has a season. And uh, because of its simple binding, um, typically, you know, you'll get a couple of years out of it, but not much more. <clears throat> Germany. So love German brooms and brushes. Um, just they've been at it for so long and making beautiful um, handcrafted um, wooden handles with a variety of different natural uh, plant based and animal based fibers. So this is from Redeker, <clears throat> who's an amazing um, broom making company in Germany, three generations of broom making that uh, just produces some of the most beautiful brooms I've ever seen and um, uh, using a variety of materials. And I sort of look to them every year to see what they're up to. Um, not that we make any similar products, but uh, sometimes to draw some inspiration for um, some of our collections. It really is uh, an art form, some of the work that they do. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm just gonna take a little sip of water and help my throat out a little. So like I said, while broom corn originated in Africa, it's not commonly produced there as much anymore. And um, they tend to use um, either broom straw or palm leaves. And as you can see, the image is very, very similar to the Caribbean version, um, to the Southeast Asian version, to the Filipino Wallace um, Ting Ting. Um, so this is probably the world's most common invention and most common household tool right here. And it's super simple and but literally used by, you know, almost every human being on the planet. So <clears throat> it's pretty cool to think that something this simple uh, could be that common. Um, so then you have the Indian broom and in India, you know, <clears throat> different communities create different types of uh, brooms using different types of grasses. And um, oftentimes the broom gets its name from the community in which it's uh, made in, in, in whatever style. But once again, it's very elongated <clears throat> style with a long handle. And this would typically be used both in and outside of the home. Home. Um, it's used, it's made using um, the tiger grass or the thialanalia. I can, still can't say it, which is uh, just great for dusting and sweeping and for moving stuff in general. Um, they also use other materials such as reeds and date palm and coconut leaves, which is wonderful. Um, in India, the, the broom really has a, a unique connection to both, you know, household use and for political use. It's been used as a symbol by politicians to sort of ground and unite community. And so it's much more than just a broom and has, um, uh, you know, a, a greater status than just being a household tool, which is pretty cool. <clears throat> So now I'd love to chat a little bit about some of the local fibers that can be used to make brooms. So broom corn does grow here um, in Manitoba. Um, it doesn't uh, necessarily grow well. Um, uh, it loves lots of heat, um, very dry, and so and uh, a very irrigated and um, soil. So as a result, a lot of our terrain here in Manitoba isn't super great for that. Um, if you do attempt to grow it, uh, it tends to grow much shorter than longer. And so uh, a lot of the stuff that we grow here, either on our acreage or with our farm partners, um, tends to be used more so for our children's room <coughs> because we're getting a lot shorter length. The broom corn we get uh, from other parts of North America typically will be in that 36 to 38 inches range, um, whereas the broom corn that we can grow here, the lengths typically are ranging in the 20 to 26 inch range, so quite a bit shorter. <clears throat> but it is possible to grow it here. Um, lots of people do, either for decorative or for broom making, and um, so we're fortunate in that sense. 
<clears throat> and then willow. Um, so brooms have been made out of willow uh, twigs for centuries and can continue to. And we have willow trees throughout Manitoba. And it's very easy to um, grapple some of those together and do a simple binding to a wooden handle, like as uh, depicted in the picture here. So that pretty much concludes um, our chat about some of the brooms we have around the globe and some of the fibers that are used. In Prairie Breeze, we're really committed to all natural fibers. Um, we're starting to delve into uh, using horse hair um, a little bit and um, working, probably not going to achieve it until post-COVID uh, to get some of those South Asian fibers into North America so that we can start to uh, play around a little bit with those fibers and see what um, works of art we can create. Just wanted to take a minute or two just to highlight some of the things that we've got on the horizon that might be of interest. <coughs> so we continue to get a lot of questions about classes and um, uh, demonstrations uh, for making brooms. Um, you know, there's a lot of mystery, you know, about making brooms. And oftentimes, even if you watch and get a hold of a video online, it's just not the same as... Um, having hands-on instruction. So we're hopeful that um, as folks get vaccinated and things slow down with COVID, that we'll be able to offer some classes in the fall. And so we're um, planning to have in-person classes uh, probably uh, September and October, just before um, Halloween, when we tend to wrap things up for that particular season out at the acreage. <clears throat> We also have um, been working hard at DIY kits, um, which will allow folks to make brooms, uh, mostly our handheld brooms um, from the courtesy of their own home. And so those will be available shortly. And um, so until, until we can get in person, that's probably the next best way for folks to get all the materials they need to make brooms um, from the safety of their home. And then, of course, uh, really exciting news for us. Uh, we've been sort of operating out of multiple places and not necessarily having a home to showcase all of the 62 brooms that we make in 46 different colors. Um, so we're super excited to have a shop and um, center really for us to uh, work out of and uh, share our passion for broom making, allow um, folks from the public to see all of our wonderful brooms and also to see the materials that we um, grow on the property uh, that go into our broom making. So uh, that's scheduled to come in um, June of this year. So um, we're working really hard uh, around the clock, literally, um, to get all the buildings and to get everything ready. So with that, um, that pretty much concludes uh, my uh, portion of the chat. And I'd love to open it up to Katrina to um, see if we have any questions. Hi, folks. Katrina with the MCC. If you have any questions, you can uh, put them into the chat. It's either on the left side of your screen or if you're on your phone, it's uh, underneath the video. And there's normally like a 10 second delay. So. <laughs> Amina, I have a question for you while we wait. Yeah. How did you get started on broom making and where did you learn how to make brooms? Great. Um, so a long journey. Um, started off, I uh, went on a business trip and bought a broom and kind of was like, huh, never really thought about brooms before, but saw this, you know, very simple um, black bound broom, um, handheld whisk and was like, this is pretty cool. I'll buy it. And then I uh, had to go on that to that same city again. Um, it was Vancouver and uh, bought another broom and said, you know what, this is really cool. I think, I think I'm a broom person. I kind of, I kind of feel there are broom people, like there are ceramic people. <laughs> and um, <clears throat> I kind of gravitated to the broom and realized, wow, you know, there's not a lot known about the broom, like who makes the broom and where is it made from and how is it made and all that stuff. <laughs> so I sort of had my interest peaked and then ultimately started seeking out um, folk art schools in the U.S. And so went to two of them uh, to learn different styles of broom making, uh, spent a small fortune. I could have retired early, <laughs> but instead I learned how to make brooms. Um, and um, so I, uh, you know, basically went to broom college. 
uh, for lack of, a, of another term. And uh, now I make brooms and, you know, I'm, I love what I do. It's, it's a an amazingly creative outlet. Um, one wouldn't think about it, but you can make all sorts of different brooms and brushes in so many different ways. And so um, for someone who um, wasn't necessarily in a very creative oriented um, profession, I now have an outlet to uh, let my creativity flow. What are your favorite fibers to make brooms with? So I love Tampico. It's just soft and silky and beautiful to touch. It also gets messy very quickly. Um, so one of the things I tell people is <clears throat> broom maker shops are the messiest places you could literally ever go into. It's like we make the most amount of mess to make something that cleans up messes. It's um, unbelievable. And I thought I was the only one that had like this disaster zone. Um, we do a really good job cleaning up every night that it's spick and span and there's not a lot of mess everywhere. But um, I was uh, connecting with another brew maker who has a great um, brew making shop in uh, Kentucky and uh, she showed me pictures of her shop and it was filthy. So it really made me feel at ease that yes, um, brew making is uh, kind of crazy messy and Tampico in general is very crazy messy. And then broom corn. <coughs> broom corn is great. Um, but one of the things I'm looking forward to the most is um, doing more work with horse hair, which I think will be fun. Horse hair is just on the brain lately. Our exhibition up at the gallery is horse hair and glass. And it's like oh, in my mind right now. <laughs> uh, what, uh, why is brew making so messy? Is it sort of just like the byproduct of the process you're doing? Is that lots of waste falls or is it like trimming the ends or is it a combination of those? It's, it's an absolute combination. So bundling, the first step in brew making is bundling and sorting. And so when you're moving that broom corn around, at the individual stocks, lots of the fiber falls off of it. <clears throat> so you've started off step one with a huge mess. Um, it's both a wet and dry process. So, you know, you've got water involved, you've got people and things moving all around, you have manual tools, and then you're doing a lot of cutting. Um, you know, my apprentice who's still just in the, the beginning journeys of her training, it's like, it's like cutting hair all day. And so we know what a hairdresser's floor looks like at the end of the day, full of, you know, hair cuttings. And that's pretty much a broom making shop. It's full of hair cuttings, but it's um, natural fibers instead. Um, and what kind of brush or what kind of brooms are you going to make with the horse hair? So we're typically going to make um, some brushes. Uh, we're actually working to partner with a company um, called Blair and Jack, and they make um, skincare for men that helps with um, shaving bumps. Um, so it's medicated skincare. And so we're working on a nice shaving brush and some makeup brushes with the horse hair. So that should be fun. And they make a brush is a dream. <clears throat> yes, actually, some of the some of the nicest and most expensive makeup brushes in the world are actually beautifully handcrafted makeup brushes that are made out of mink. So, yeah, we're not going that far. It's kind of hard to get mink around here. So we're going we're gonna, to uh, stick to our uh, horse here. We might delve into squirrels if I get desperate and find enough in the neighborhood. But I'm thinking we'll probably stay away from that as well. <laughs> well, Amina, thank you so much for your talk today. That was awesome. And uh, thank you for sharing so much about brooms. I, Brew making is a thing that I don't know a tremendous amount about. And that was so interesting. And I've learned so much. Thank you so much. Well, thank you so much. It was a pleasure. Have a good night, everyone. <laughs>